We're so excited to have Sherry Crabtree um, presenting for us today on Growing Pawpaws. Sherry Crabtree is the Horticulture Research and Extension Associate with the Kentucky State Land Grant um, Program with Kentucky State University and um, does so much with their pawpaw program. And I have really enjoyed her presentations in the past. And, um, and uh, KSU is kind of the hub for uh, pawpaws and um, growing different varieties and things. So I will let you take it over, Sherry. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'll go ahead and share my screen, get the PowerPoint going. All right. Minimize that. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I, like Faye said, my name is Sherry Crabtree. I'm um, a research and extension associate in horticulture with Kentucky State University Land Grant Program. And we're gonna talk today about growing pawpaws in Kentucky. Like she said, Kentucky State University, we're actually the only full-time research program in the world devoted to pawpaw. There are other universities that do some work with pawpaw, but we are kind of the, the hub for pawpaw. Um, so what is a pawpaw? A lot of you may have already grown or eaten pawpaws before and be somewhat familiar with them. Um, the scientific name is Asimina triloba. So pawpaws are in the custard apple family. And one interesting thing about that, the rest of the family is all tropical fruits, subtropical or tropical fruits. Pawpaw is the only temperate member of the family, the only member of that family that can be grown um, where it gets cold, where we have frosts and freezes. So that's why the, the fruit, if you've tasted it, has a very tropical flavor. The tree has a kind of tropical appearance. It's a fairly slow growing, medium sized tree, usually gets um, 20, 25 feet tall maximum has a dense pyramidal shape in full sun. In the wild, they're a little bit more open um, and lanky looking. The fruit are usually in clusters. Sometimes they're single fruit, but more often they're in clusters, usually of two to five fruit in a cluster. And the fruit can be a half a pound to a pound in size. And that is for improved cultivars. If you have seedlings or wild trees, usually they will have smaller fruit, but improved cultivars are usually about a half a pound on average. So like we mentioned, pawpaw being in this tropical family, the fruit has this tropical flavor and aroma. If you haven't tasted it, I think the best description, best comparison is a blend of mango and banana, but different varieties have different undertones. Some have pineapple flavor, some have coconut, caramel, vanilla, um, you know, different undertones like that to the fruit. And the texture is similar to a ripe avocado. It's almost a custard-like texture that you can eat with a spoon when they're ripe. And papa fruit are very nutritious. They're high in vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, which we'll look at later. So when do papas flower? They're starting to flower right now. Um, so April to May in Kentucky. And um, a lot of people think you do need two trees for cross-pollination. And so a lot of people assume that means there are male and female trees. They're actually male and female parts on the same tree and the same flower. They're just not very self-fertile. So you do need two trees, but that's just because they're not self-fertile. All trees have both male and female parts. And we did have a graduate student look at whether some pawpaws are self-fruitful, can self-pollinate. It, we suspected for a while that some could because you'll see an individual isolated tree that will have a few fruit on it. And so we found that they are somewhat self-fruitful. A, a single tree will self-pollinate and set a few fruit, but not very many. So you do want to for good, for a good crop, for good yield. But if you have a single tree, you may get a few fruit on it. One unique thing about pawpaw flowers is they are pollinated by flies and beetles instead of by bees. And they also flower over a long period of time, which helps them escape a lot of frost and freeze events. Like we had, um, had a freeze last week, but only a few of the flowers were open. Most of the flowers on the tree were still in bud or closed and those survived, the open flowers were killed. But as you see in the bottom photo, you've got developing fruit and an open flower and a closed flower all on the same tree at the same time. So flowering over a period of three to four weeks and they're at different hardiness stages helps avoid losing the crop to frost and freezes. 
Pawpaws are a nice part of edible landscaping also. They have this nice bright gold fall color and they also attract the zebra swallowtail butterflies. So a lot of people are interested in butterflies and planting butterfly gardens will plant pawpaw trees just to attract this butterfly because it is the exclusive host plant. So pawpaw is the only plant that the larva of the zebra swallowtail butterfly feed on. They have an exclusive relationship. So if you see that butterfly around, you know that there are pawpaws nearby. The native range of pawpaw is most of the Eastern US. Um, it's zones five to eight. It can be grown in, in zone nine, but generally zones five to eight, kind of in the Mid-South Ohio Valley region, um, from Northern Florida up to Southern Michigan, Southern New York, even into Southern Ontario, Canada and a little bit west of the Mississippi River into eastern um, Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas is the native range. They can be grown anywhere. Um, zones five to eight and nine is kind of borderline um, for the chill hours, which we actually have graduate students looking at the chill hours required for pawpaw, which is not a problem here in Kentucky, but people wanna grow them in Florida or Southern California and places like that where they don't get much cold weather in the winter. And some of those places are kind of borderline for having enough cold for the trees to go dormant. And then they have a certain number of chill hours they require to then flower and start growing in the spring. So really any temperate areas and they are being grown worldwide. There are people growing pawpaws in Europe um, and some parts of Asia. So pretty much anywhere with a temperate growing climate, they can be grown. So being a native fruit to the US, there's a lot of history with pawpaw. And the first written record of pawpaws being grown was in 1541 that Flora Hernando de Soto wrote about Native Americans growing and eating pawpaws in the Mississippi River Valley. Then Lewis and Clark, you might remember, um, explored out west, um, explored to Oregon. When they were on their return trip back from Oregon in Missouri, they ran out of food and they foraged for wild food and found pawpaws. And um, they survived on pawpaws for several days. So Lewis and Clark wrote in their journal that pawpaws actually saved them from starvation. A lot of our historical figures, founding fathers um, were also pawpaw fans. George Washington, it's written that chilled pawpaw was his favorite fruit or his favorite dessert was chilled pawpaw. Um, Thomas Jefferson, you may know, was kind of a horticulturist. He was really interested in growing and breeding plants. He sent pawpaw seeds. There's um, letters actually in the Library of Congress of him, him sending seeds, including pawpaw seeds, to friends in France. So Thomas Jefferson probably introduced pawpaw to Europe. And Daniel Boone, Mark Twain, there's um, written records, letters of them being pawpaw fans. So lots of history there. A lot of people are more familiar with pawpaws growing in the wild. And you do find a lot of pawpaw trees in the wild here in Kentucky and surrounding states. They're usually part of the understory in forests, and especially along um, riverbanks and creeks and streams, areas like that is where they like to grow in the wild. And they form these large patches. If you can see in this photo, most of the lower growing trees in this photo are pawpaw trees. And they spread and form these huge patches, which can cover a pretty large area by root suckers. So it's it looks like many trees, but Often they're all from one root system. And that's part of the reason a lot of people say they have wild trees or they found, found pawpaws growing in the woods in the park and they don't have any fruit or they don't have many fruit. And there's several reasons. One is because of the shade. Even though in the wild they're found in the shade, they don't produce many fruit when grown in the shade. They just don't get enough energy from the sun. And also self incompatibility. Remember, they need to cross pollinate to set fruit. And it, like I said, even though this looks like a lot of trees, if they're all from one root system, they're all all identical genetically. So if there's not another seedling in there um, to cross pollinate with, then that can lead to lack of fruit set. Um, we've done studies in the past looking at diversity in wild patches, and usually the wild patches are mostly one genotype. They're mostly all from one root system, but there are usually two or three different ones that are from seeds that have dropped and germinate that you'll find in the patches. 
And a lot of times the wild fruit is poor quality. They are usually smaller and seedier and sometimes have off flavors compared to improved cultivars. So if you have wild pawpaw patches, whoops, that you want to um, make more productive, one, you want to thin it out to choose the strongest trees and so they're not growing too close together. So to about eight feet apart and select the strongest trees and also anything to get more sunlight into the patch um, to increase fruit set. So either prune or clear out trees that are shading the pawpaws to get more light in and also clear out other underbrush. We see a lot of, especially invasive species like bush honeysuckle that kind of gets in the same environment and competes with the pawpaws and crowd, crowd them out. You can also bring in um, other trees, seedlings from another place or grafted trees to bring in more diversity to have cross-pollination. And you can also graft wild trees if the fruit's poor quality and you can get cyan wood of a better tree. You can go in and graft, um, graft the wild trees. It is hard to dig and transplant root suckers. A lot of people ask about that. And they usually don't have a lot of roots of their own. They're kind of connected by a runner almost um, to the main root system. So they're hard to transplant, but if they're, if they're small, it's, it's just about impossible to transplant a big pawpaw tree because once they get really big, they'll um, send down a tap root. But um, small trees that are root suckers, you can cut around them with a shovel and that kind of severs the root. Um, that's attaching it to the, the big root system and leave it in the ground for another year and it will develop more of a root system of its own and then dig it the following spring to transplant it. So for um, kind of domesticating pawpaws since they're, they're wild here, way back 1916, there was actually a contest for best pawpaws by the American Genetics Association. And they predicted that there would be a commercial industry that would start, that's over a hundred years ago. And of course, the industry didn't really develop. There are more commercial pawpaw growers than there were um, 20 years ago, but you don't find them in Kroger and Walmart and places like that. The main reason is they have a really short shelf life when pawpaw fruit are ripe. They can't be stored a long time or transported long distances, which really, you know, in the U.S. now, everything is, is shipped long distances and needs needs to be stored well is what a lot of fruit breeding is focused on. So, um, you know, it's not like apples and grapes that, that have a long shelf life. So it's still kind of a small local market. So there's a lot of interest in pawpaws in about the 1990s is when there's this resurgence of interest, the Pawpaw Foundation. We started our pawpaw research program in 1990 and the Ohio Pawpaw Festival started in 99 and North American Pawpaw Growers Association, which is the main grower organization started in 2000. So that's when we kind of started seeing this upswing in interest in pawpaws. So our main goals at KSU um, are to preserve and evaluate genetic diversity in pawpaw. We do a lot of breeding to develop superior cultivars and work on orchard management recommendations for growers. So things, you know, fertilization, irrigation, um, shading, disease management, things like that. And we assist growers, everybody from backyard growers to commercial producers in, in pawpaw production. And we've done some work looking at um, harvest and post-harvest storage methods and developing value-added products. So if you want to grow pawpaws, if you want to grow some pawpaw trees, first you want to select a good site. You want somewhere that has good airflow, good air drainage. So usually at the ideal is high on a slope is an ideal site. You don't want to be in the lowest area that you have because cold air is heavier and denser and settles in these low areas and becomes a frost pocket. So they're gonna be a lot more prone to frost injury, freeze and frost damage in low lying areas. Pawpaws um, prefer a deep, fertile, well-drained soil that has a lot of organic matter, slightly acid to neutral pH, but they're tolerant of other soil types. Um, they can grow with some clay or some sand. You just don't want like a super heavy clay soil they would not like, um, but some clay is fine. You do want to um, control weeds. That's one thing. Pawpaws are pretty low maintenance, but 
especially when trees are small when they're young, they don't compete well with having a lot of weeds and grass growing right up around the trees. So if you have just a few trees, um, mulch is good. You know, you can just hand pull weeds or hoe and put down mulch around trees to have weed control. And that also helps with um, moisture, conserve moisture in the soil, having mulch down. Wood chip mulch or straw mulch, either one is fine. They do need irrigation, especially the first couple of years after they're planted. Um, they need a minimum of one inch of rain per week. So in our orchards, we have drip irrigation. And again, if you just have a few trees in your yard, just make sure that you go out and water them regularly, especially in the hottest, driest parts of the summer. And particularly if just like any, um, any fruits, vegetables, anything like that, especially if you're doing, if you haven't grown on that site before, or if you're a commercial grower, you want to test the soil before planting to see if you're deficient in anything and you need to amend the soil before planting. Generally, pawpaws don't really have um, specific nutrient requirements other than needing some nitrogen in the spring. And like we mentioned earlier with the wild patches, um, pawpaws will grow in the shade. A lot of people think that they have to be in the shade since in the wild they're found in the shade, but they produce more fruit, higher yields, and full sun. So ideally you want them to be in full sun. Very small seedlings are sensitive to UV light, so they do need shade until they're about 18 inches tall. If you're buying a tree from a nursery, generally they're going to be taller than 18 inches, but um, if you're starting them from seed or if you get a really small tree, they do need some shade until they're 18 inches tall, and after that, they can be in full sun. Um, the spacing that we recommend is eight to 10 feet between trees. And if you're playing them in your yard, you're kind of landscaping and you want them to be farther apart, they can be, but you don't want to go farther than 30 feet apart or um, you'll have issues with poor pollination. Just, it's hard for insects to fly that far, especially the flies and beetles that pollinate pawpaws are not quite as active as bees um, flying long distances. And it, for an orchard and orchard setting, we do 18 to 20 feet between rows, kind of depends on what equipment you're trying to get down the rows, which that works out to be 295 trees per acre. We recommend spring planting. So right about now, we're actually gonna be planting some trees next week. Um, spring planting has been best in the past in Kentucky. We're actually looking at, we're doing an experiment looking at fall planting also. So we're gonna see how fall planting compares to spring planting. We've always recommended spring planting, but I think it's based on basically one time that we put in trees in the fall and a lot of them died. And of course that could be, there's so much year to year variation that could be from other reasons other than being planted in the fall. So we wanted to take another look at planting in the fall, but for now we recommend spring planting. Um, right about now, April to early May is a good time before it gets too hot. So for maintaining trees um, once they're planted, as far as pruning, um, you can prune pawpaws to a central leader, which is similar to an apple tree, um, that shape, or you can leave them un, basically unpruned. We did a study looking at this, and the tree on the left is the one pruned to a central leader, similar to apple tree. The tree on the right is the one that was minimal pruning, which was basically no pruning unless it was like a broken branch or a branch that was laying on the ground or something that really needed to be removed. That, that's basically no pruning. And it was really a toss up. It's kind of your preference, how you want your tree to look. The trees pruned to a central leader were stronger, didn't have as many broken limbs because you were choosing the strongest limbs with the best angle. They were easier to pick from just because it's, yes, so you can see it's more open. You can see the fruit better. And we thought it might be an issue with the fruit being more exposed to the sun. They might get sunburned, but that was not a problem. Um, they were a little bit slower to come into production and had slightly lower yields when they were younger. Once they were mature, that evened out. But really just because you're removing some of the wood that would have produced fruit is the only reason why. 
and a little bit more labor as far as pruning, more labor in the spring to prune them. So it's kind of, you know, a lot of people like the more naturalized appearance of the unpruned tree, but some people want it to look neat and tidy. So it's kind of your personal preference. It is a lot easier to mow and weed eat and harvest and things like that around the trees that are pruned a little bit more, at least the limbs, um, the low limbs removed. As far as fertilization, um, for the most part, we just apply nitrogen unless your soil is deficient and something else that's their main need is nitrogen. We use urea and in the organic area, we use a bone feather blood meal, um, which Nature Safe is the brand we use, but they're not particular about nitrogen source. You can use um, other products. You can use fish emulsion, composted manure. Um, we've used liquid fertilizer like Peters or miracle Grow before, especially container plants, we use those. So they need about one to three ounce, ounces of nitrogen per tree the first few years, and then up that to four or five ounces later. And you wanna fertilize in the spring, just like other fruit trees, um, and about March in Kentucky is a good time to fertilize your trees. And if you're fertilizing, especially something like the liquid fertilizers that you apply weekly, you want to stop by August 1st because you don't want to be encouraging new growth and have a lot of green new growth when they should be shutting down for the fall. And you will see um, you know, yellowing of leaves if you have a nitrogen deficiency. One thing we do recommend is either trunk wraps or painting tree trunks. We had a lot of trees that had this bark cracking that you see in the lower photo, which these are both kind of extreme examples of it, but if it's to that extreme, then it can kill trees. If it kills enough of the bark, it can kill the trees. So this is Southwest injury or sun scald, which is basically in the winter time, the Southwest side of the tree is where the, the sun shines the strongest and um, the tree is dormant and the sap's not flowing. Um, and the sun shining on that side of the tree and the bark being dark absorbs the, the heat and heats up on that side of the tree and kind of dehardens it. Then it gets cold again and then it gets hot again. And that can cause cracking on the trunk. So the painting the trunks, this is um, a mix of two thirds latex paint and one third water reflects the light and keeps it from um, having so much temperature extremes and prevents the trunk cracking. And you can use those light colored trunk wraps also. And latex paint, you don't want to use oil-based paint. Oil-based paint is toxic to trees, but for latex paint, you can use indoor or outdoor, either one. And disease issues, um, this is the main disease that we see is um, it's called phylosticta, it's a fungal disease. And it's worth in wet years, which most fungal diseases are because they need leaf wetness or wetness on the fruit to spread. Usually it's just cosmetic. So the fruit, for example, you see in the bottom center, um, the black spots are just on the skin. If you cut it open, it doesn't cause a rot on the inside of the fruit. But when it gets really severe, like the fruit on the right, it can cause cracking on the fruit. So we are looking at using sulfur or copper to control this. And there's graduate students that are working on it um, right now, currently. So we'll have the results of that hopefully soon and be able to make some recommendations. Um, but that's the main disease that we see on our pawpaw trees. Um, as far as insect pests, there are not a lot of insects that bother pawpaws. There is the Asimino webworm, which we've actually never seen of all the pawpaw trees we have on our farm. We've never seen this, but there's a grower we work with in Eastern Kentucky that has these pretty bad. So I think it just depends on your site, whether these are around. They're kind of like fall webworms. They build um, nests, kind of the webbing on the ends of branches. They're kind of fold up the leaves and build a web. Usually you don't have a lot of those and you can just remove them, just snip out the leaves that have them. Um, something like BT that works, just targets um, caterpillars would work against those also, but usually it's not something that you need to control chemically. And the pawpaw peduncle borer is a moth that has a larva. That The peduncle is the stem that attaches the flower or the fruit to the tree. And that's where it was actually first seen was it bores into the stems on flowers and makes the flowers shrivel up and drop off. 
but we've also seen it, it will burrow into the twigs and into the fruit. However, it's, it's very uncommon also. We counted several years and it was in about 3% of the fruit. So that's not a threshold that you're worried about spraying or any kind of chemical control at. But you do wanna be aware if you're eating a fruit and you see um, the frass on the outside that indicates that there's an insect in there, you want to be aware of that. But this is not something that you see frequently that you need to spray for. Um, there is a pawpaw sphinx moth, which we also hardly ever see, but it's it looks very similar to a tobacco hornworm. And Japanese beetles will feed on pawpaws a little bit, but as you probably know, they like just about everything. They do not prefer pawpaws. They will go to our grapes and blackberries and other trees before they'll go to the pawpaws, but you do see a little feeding damage of Japanese beetles. So I see a few questions in the chat. I'll probably, I think I've answered, I was gonna say I'll save some till the end, but um, I think I answered about how close trees have to be in order to pollinate at least 30 feet, but ideally eight to 10 feet. And um, we fertilize every year. If you have, if you've done a soil test and you have good soil fertility, um, and there's no signs of nitrogen deficiency. You don't have to fertilize every year, but generally we do. Most plants need a little bit of nitrogen boost every year um, to fertilize. Um, and yes, as far as pruning, I should have mentioned that on the pruning slide, a lot of times pawpaws will send up root suckers around the trees. We generally prune those out. I know some people that again, like a more naturalized look and they want to have a wild pawpaw patch basically. And so you can let a few grow and select the biggest, strongest ones, but generally we prune out the root suckers um, as they come up. One thing, if it's a seedling, um, as far as cross-pollination, the, um, so the root suckers, if you have a seedling, the root sucker is gonna be identical to the seedling, so they couldn't cross-pollinate. If you have a grafted tree, the root sucker is going to be whatever the root stock was. So, I guess the good thing is it could cross pollinate with your grafted tree, but the bad thing is that it's not going to be the superior fruit type of the grafted tree. It's going to be whatever the seedling rootstock was. Um, there, somebody asked about fertilizing using horse manure from horses that graze on herbicide treated pastures. I don't know of that being a problem. Um, it should not be, it shouldn't be a problem. I, I would have to look into it, to be honest. I don't think that enough of the herbicide would survive passing through and being in the manure. And especially if it's not getting on the foliage, usually um, the herbicides absorb through the foliage. And so like, for example, we've used glyphosate for weed control. And if you don't hit the tree with it, it's fine. Getting it on the grass is okay but you want to avoid spraying, you know, getting it on any of the leaves, obviously. So the horse manure should be fine. And we do see um, animal pests are probably a bigger problem in pawpaw than the insect pests. A lot of things like to eat the fruit. So raccoons, possums, groundhogs um, will eat the fruit, especially when they fall on the ground, they will eat the fruit. If they're really looking for food, they will even climb the tree sometimes to get fruit. There's not, just like everything else, there's not a lot of good control measures except for electric fence can help, but it's hard to keep all these different sizes of animals out when you have, you know, if you have deer and skunks and raccoons and they're all kind of different sizes, it's kind of hard to completely exclude them with an electric fence. The main thing is beating them to the fruit. Um, usually they will go after the super ripe fruit that's fallen on the ground. So if you pick it before it falls on the ground, then often you can beat them to it. Deer are not really a problem with pawpaw. They don't like to feed on the leaves. I won't say they never will, but it's not their preferred food. They do seem to like to rub their antlers on pawpaws. I don't know why they would be especially attracted to pawpaws over anything else, but it does seem like on the farm, they rub their antlers on pawpaws more than other trees. Um, I think they like a particular size of tree. So those are the main animal pests that we see. So for growing your own pawpaws, you can start them from seed. There are some special things you need to do from seed. So when 
so in the fall, when the fruits are ripe, you take the seed out of the fruit, um, you clean it off. It needs to be stratified, cold stratified in the refrigerator for at least 100 days, which kind of mimics what it gets in the wild in the winter time. You do not want to let them dry out. So they need to be in something that'll stay moist, like a damp peat moss. Um, oops. Damp, it's a paper towel, um, you know, something like that that keeps them damp so they don't dry out. They are killed by being stored in the freezer. And a lot of people ask, how do they survive the winter when they're killed in the freezer? And that's a good question um, that we probably need to look at. But I think it has to do one with the um, temperature extreme and the freezer, they're, they're held at a very cold temperature for, you know, a constant time. And in the wild, they would reach freezing temperatures for, you know, a lot of times just a few hours, then they would warm back up. And they're also protected somewhat by the leaf litter and if it's still in the fruit that's rotting on the ground and things like that. Um, so it's probably mostly that the temperature outside is usually not quite as cold as the temperature in the freezer, but also not a lot of seeds survive outside, not as many as you would think. Remember when you're talking about the wild patches and almost the entirety of the wild patches are from root suckers and stuff from seedlings. So there's not really that many different seedlings that are coming up in wild patches. So probably a lot of them are killed by the freezing temperatures in the winter. So anyway, don't store them in the freezer is the takeaway. Usually nurseries start pawpaws in containers because they have a tap root. So they, they're hard to start in the field and then dig. Um, and they do need these deep pots to accommodate the tap root. So starting them from seed, um, just know that they're not true to type from seed. So they're not gonna be identical to the parent. Um, if they're from good parents, then you're likely, the seedling's likely to have good fruit. If it's um, from a wild tree that doesn't have very good fruit, then it's probably also not gonna have good fruit. So there are some similar, similarities to the parent, but they're not identical to the parent. And it does take a while to produce um, fruit from seedling um, from seed. It takes seven to eight years um, for the trees to get big enough to produce fruit when grown from seed. Okay, so um, to propagate clonally, so to propagate true to type, um, a lot of people, a lot of other plants you can take, stem cuttings. Papa, unfortunately, that doesn't work. It's, it's pretty difficult to propagate, so you can't take a cutting off of a papa and stick it in rooting powder and put it in water, soil, and have it root. Um, and also layering, air layering, mound layering does not work very well with papa. So how we propagate these cultivars true to type is through grafting. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this already, but grafting is basically where you connect two plant parts together so that they grow together and unite as one plant. Um, so you have a rootstock, which with pawpaw is just a seedling. There's not specific rootstocks for pawpaw like there are with apples. So you take just any pawpaw seedling and then you take a cutting off of the tree that you want to propagate and make knife cuts and um, unite them together, wrap them up, and they grow together to form, form one plant of the cultivar that you are wanting to propagate. So that's what this looks like. Um, chip budding is the same thing where you just are using one bud instead of a cutting um, to graft with. So you can either do this on seedlings that you've grown in containers or on trees that are already growing outside, out in the field or in the woods. On bigger trees, there are ways to do what's called top working where you cut a bigger tree off and you can do a graft um, called bark inlay is what we use to graft larger trees. And one advantage of grafted trees is they will fruit in only about three years, three to four years. The main advantage is that you're propagating them true to type because you're taking that cutting or bud off of the cultivar that you wanna propagate. You're propagating that identical variety. So again, like we said there, pawpaw is not true to seed and seedlings do take longer to produce fruit um, than grafted trees. And that's kind of an extreme example, but a lot of people think of the lower photo the typical wild seedling um, as what pawpaw fruit are like. And they may think that they don't like them. They say, oh, they're little and seedy and bitter. But th these improved cultivars have a lot larger fruit, a better fruit to seed ratio and better flavors. 
So we'll go through some photos, but some cultivars that do well here in Kentucky are KSU Atwood, KSU Benson, and KSU Chappelle are the three that we have developed and released from KSU. Um, Sunflower, Overlease, NC1, Susquehanna, Wabash, Potomac, and Shenandoah are all cultivars that we recommend here. So KSU Atwood was our first cultivar release. It has kind of a mango flavor. It has this orange colored flesh, a more mango flavor, um, has good yields, high yields. It's somewhat late season ripening. So here in Kentucky, it's about mid-September, about September 10th or so is when you see these getting ripe. KSU Benson was our second cultivar release. One unique thing about it, it has this really round shape, almost a, like a baseball or softball size shape. Benson is earlier ripening, so by late August, we'll see these getting ripe here in Central Kentucky. KSU Chappelle was our third cultivar release. And it kind of fills in the gap. It's mid-season, so it starts getting ripe in early September, usually about September, say third through fifth on average. It's very vigorous. It's probably the most vigorous and fast growing of our three cultivars. Um, very productive. It has a little bit milder flavor, kind of a banana pineapple flavor. And also is, um, has a good seed to fruit ratio. These are some others that we recommend that are from other breeders, not from KSU. Susquehanna is from a breeder in West Virginia. It has a really excellent flavor and large size. It's won a lot of taste tests that we've had here and at the Ohio Pawpaw Festival. So it's a really good one flavor wise. Um, Sunflower and Shenandoah, if you like a more mild banana-like flavor, um, those both do well here and have a more mild flavor. Overlease has round fruit and has kind of a cantaloupe-like flavor. So if you like melons or cantaloupe, Overlease would be a good one for you. Um, NC1 and Wabash also do well here in Kentucky. They have a really dark, both of them, even though they're not related, but they both have a really dark orange colored flesh. Wabash has that round shape. That's why he named it Wabash after Wabash Cannonball was part of the um, idea behind it because it's kind of cannonball shape. So for nurseries in Kentucky that sell pawpaw trees, England's Orchard and Nursery and Peaceful Heritage Nursery both sell pawpaw trees, both of um, KSU cultivars. They are licensed propagators for KSU cultivars and other varieties. Nolan River Nut Tree Nursery, I left them on the list, but their owner passed away and I think their kids are still kind of trying to decide what to do with the nursery. So they may hopefully um, remain in business, but they're not selling right now. So put them on, their, on your list, but um, check back with them next year. Kentucky Division of Forestry um, also sells pawpaw seedlings. They're not grafted trees of any particular cultivar, but they sell bundles of pawpaw seedlings at a low cost. So if you're wanting a large number of trees or wanting your own trees to graft, the Division of Forestry um, would be a good place to get them. And we do a lot of breeding. So we're doing breeding and variety trials, evaluating these selections um, for hopefully the next cultivar that we will release. Um, there's a few, they're just numbered for now. And if we decide to release them, they'll be given a name, but they'll always have KSU in the first part of their name if you see them listed somewhere. So pawpaw harvest, um, pawpaws get ripe in late August through late September in Kentucky. And the harvest um, is a little bit more labor intensive than some fruits. For one, you can't really tell by looking at the fruit that pawpaws ripe, unfortunately, because some of them will have a little bit of a yellow color change, but usually they're still green even when they're ripe. They will start to drop off the tree when they're ripe. So that's one way that you know, you know, you walk through the orchard and you see a few fruit under a tree and you know that that tree is starting to ripen. And if you're hand harvesting them, they will come off easy in your hand when they're ripe. Um, and they're also soft, kind of like a peach, a similar feel to a ripe peach. So you want to you know, feel them, see if they feel soft and just give it kind of a gentle wiggle or gentle pull and it will come off in your hand if it's ripe. If it's hard and you have to you know, yank it and twist it to get it off the tree, then it's not ready to pick yet. So it does, when the fruit are ripe, they're soft and they bruise easily. 
the photo on the bottom is kind of what not to do. You don't want to stack them really deep in a box. You want to have a layer of usually two fruit at the most because if they're stacked really deep in a box or um, basket, the ones at the bottom, if they're ripe, will get squished. So one good thing about pawpaws is you don't get your whole harvest all at once. So you're not inundated with a ton of fruit at the same time. We were talking about how they flower over a long period of time and the harvest is also over a long period from a single tree. So the same tree, you'll have fruit ripening over about a three to four week period. And sometimes even in the same cluster, like one fruit in that cluster may be ripe and the others may take another week to get ripe. When they are ripe, I said they have a, a shelf life of only a couple of days when they're ripe and soft. There are a few ways that you can um, kind of help them have a longer shelf life. One, you can pick them when they're just starting to get ripe, um, but they need to be starting the ripening process. It, it's basically by touch. When they're just barely starting to get soft, you can pick them and they will ripen off the tree at that point. If they're completely hard as a rock, they will not ripen off the tree. So they have to be starting to get a little bit soft to be able to pick them and ripen them off the tree. So you can pick them at that point and either let them ripen at room temperature right then, or you can put them in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks and then bring them out to, to fully ripen. So that extends the shelf life some. It's a good you know, short-term storage method. For longer-term storage, um, you want to freeze the fruit. So when you're either processing them to freeze or just for eating, some things you wanna look out for is, again, they bruise easily. And sometimes if it's really severe bruising, like you see in this photo, it can be kind of bitter where it's bruised. We sometimes see this pink discoloration in the middle of the fruit, which is kind of internal damage. It's almost like internal bruising or internal heat damage. And so we avoid that. We would um, you know, cut the fruit in half and, and toss the half that was discolored like that. And again, the pop up peduncle borer from earlier, you sometimes see in the fruit, not very often, but you do want to look out if you see that brown powdery stuff, the frass coming out of the fruit, that indicates that there's a larva inside the fruit. So you want to be careful of that. But again, we don't see it, you know, less than 5% of the fruit we saw it in. The skin is bitter. The, the skin is thin. It's not easily peeled like a banana. So it's thin and not tough, but it is bitter. So you don't want to eat the skin. And you also don't want to eat the seeds. Um, the seeds actually, the skin won't make you sick. It just tastes bad. The seeds have alkaloid compounds in them that will make you sick to your stomach. So you don't want to accidentally eat a seed, which you're not, they're large enough. They're about the size of a lima bean and they're hard. So you're not going to accidentally eat a seed when you're, you know, slicing and eating a fruit. But say you're, um, pureeing it to freeze or you're making a milkshake or a smoothie, you don't want to accidentally get a seed in the blender and chop it up. Um, that, that would make you sick to your stomach. Um, so you want to make sure that you get seeds out before you process them. So processing the fruit to freeze, um, it's a little bit, to do it completely by hand, it's a little bit messy and labor intensive because again, you got to get the skin and the seeds out. We used to use colanders when we were only processing a few fruit. We would basically cut them in half and scoop out the insides and discard the skin and put it into a colander and push it through the colander with a spoon. Or you can do the same thing with a mesh bag and squeeze it through the mesh bag and that removes the seeds, separates the seeds from the pulp. This is what we started using when we started processing more fruit. Um, is this, the brand that we got is Roma, but there's several brands that are similar food mills, um, Squeezo and Victorinox are several brands um, that we got to be able to do this more quickly. So what you need is the grape spiral removes the seeds, but you do need to modify it for pawpaws um, because it's made to remove grape seeds. And obviously pawpaw seeds are a lot bigger than grape seeds. So you need to cut off the last two spirals or file them down um, basically to where it's wide enough for the pawpaw seeds to pass through. And we use the pumpkin screen, which is the mid-size screen. So you still have the step of cutting the fruit in half, scoop out the insides, but you feed that through um, the top, that bowl on the top, and it gets pushed through, you turn the crank, 
and that moves it through the spiral and the spiral removes the seed, separates the seeds from the pulp, um, which you see coming out in the bottom picture. You do need to run it through a few times because a lot of pulp still sticks to the seed. So we usually run it through three times to get as much pulp off as possible. Then you can put it in freezer bags to freeze. So this is kind of the next step up. This is more, this is a commercial pieces, piece of equipment where this is more of a homeowner scale. Um, but this is what we're using right now. But I will say we have these in our kitchen at the farm and in the mobile kitchen, which is available for people to rent to make um, value added products. So if you're a larger scale grower of pawpaw, you can rent time in our kitchen and be able to use this. Um, so this is basically kind of a souped up version of this food mill. It works in a similar way. And again, there's, you still have to cut in half, scoop out the insides or peel it with a knife, however you want to remove the skin. There's not a good way, a good mechanized way to remove the skin right now. Um, so you basically, it's similar to the food mill, you feed it through the top and it goes into the, um, so the round silver barrel has, um, has kind of paddles inside that tumble it around and push it through mesh. And so out of one side, the seeds come from one side, the pulp comes out of the other side. But you see the seeds are a lot cleaner in this compared to how clean the seeds are with this food mill. So it skips, skips the seeds a lot cleaner and it's a lot faster. So for processing, ideally you want to have large fruit, small fruit. A lot of times you just get like a teaspoon of pulp out of it and it's not really um, labor cost effective. You can store the pop-up pulp in a freezer, um, in freezer bags. Make sure you squeeze all the air out for up to two years. Then thaw it in the refrigerator. You want to try to thaw it gently and keep it from being exposed to the air so it doesn't brown as it thaws out. Then you can use it in ice cream, smoothies, baked goods, jam, things like that. As far as the nutritional value of pawpaw, um, they're pretty high in protein and good fats, the monounsaturated fatty acids compared to other fruits. They're most similar to bananas as far as um, their nutritional value. So they're fairly similar to banana, but you see they compare favorably to banana, apple and orange. Um, higher in all minerals except for potassium than any of those fruits. And it's pretty close to banana and potassium level and bananas you know, are known for being high in potassium. So very nutritious fruit. As far as the markets for selling pawpaws, with the short shelf life, it's really you know, a more small local market, usually at farmer's markets. Local produce markets like Good Foods Co-op in Lexington, you'll see pawpaw fruit for sale. And um, there are some people that do online mail order sales, um, which is a little bit tricky, you know, packing it to be able to be shipped when the fruit is so soft. Um, and of course, it's a higher cost per pound when you have the shipping added in. So with the short shelf life, really the, the frozen pulp or the value added products are are the best kind of the future for being able to get it nationwide, that is. As far as locally, your local farmer's market is the best place to find fruit. A lot of growers also sell to restaurants, wineries, and breweries, which in the past few years, the distilleries, breweries, and wineries in the state are by far the biggest market for pop off fruit in Kentucky. That's where most of our growers have been selling the bulk of their crop to. So these are some products that you see, um, Papa wine, Papa beer, Papa brandy. And there's several of these that are local. So Wildside Wineries and for sales, they do a Papa wine. Um, I don't have a photo of it, but Jephtha Creed Distillery that's in Shelbyville does a Papa brandy. And um, they've also done Papa beer at, this was Ethereal Brewing, which is in Lexington and West Six Brewing did a Papa beer one year as kind of a seasonal flavor. Baked goods, basically any recipe that calls for banana, you can substitute equal amounts of pop pulp. pulp. So um, banana bread, cake, muffins, things like that. And it's also good in, since the flavor, the texture of papa is so creamy, things like pudding and creme brulee are really good um, with pop pulp, so it kind of plays to the creamy texture of the fruit. 
um, and pawpaw fruit, since it's so sweet, we usually think about desserts and sweet uses for it. But you can also use it in hot sauces like barbecue sauce, hot sauce. There actually was this pawpaw chipotle hot sauce by a company in Ohio. Unfortunately, I don't think they sell it anymore. I'm not sure why, but um, it, I've had good homemade barbecue sauces that have pawpaw puree in it. And also fruit salsa, like a mango salsa recipe, you can substitute pawpaw in it. Ice cream is probably my favorite use for pawpaw other than just eating it um, fresh. I think it's the same for a lot of people. And this is our recipe for pawpaw ice cream that we developed at KSU if you want to take a screenshot or write it down. This makes a gallon. So if you're using like a little um, home countertop ice cream maker, you need to cut, may need to cut it down, but it's a really simple recipe that doesn't have any egg in it, just pawpaw, milk, cream, and sugar. You can also just blend it with yogurt, um, make smoothies, things like that. And that's probably how I personally like it best is in things that are uncooked, um, like ice cream and smoothies, the, the flavor comes out more. This is a pawpaw jam recipe that we developed at KSU. And again, it's a pretty simple recipe. We did a taste test, which you see at the bottom with a lot of different recipes that had spices that were more like apple butter. Some of them had other fruit juices added, but what, what most people preferred was this really simple recipe that's just pawpaw and sugar and um, then the pectin and, and fruit fresh. And I do wanna mention we are, um, we do have a website that has our contact information, frequently asked questions. We're on Facebook, which is probably more up to date than the website, um, just because it's easier to edit. So if you have Facebook, you can search for KSU Pawpaw. Um, we have a YouTube channel, which is KSU Pawpaw, which the newest videos, um, our media team usually likes to put it more on Facebook instead of YouTube, but we have some older videos on YouTube. And I wanna mention, um, as we were talking about at the beginning, in person, we're kind of slowly getting back to in-person programming. Um, so our third Thursday thing is in September is always horticulture and pawpaws. Um, I don't know whether it will be virtual or in person this year, but it will happen regardless, even if it's virtual, then it will happen on September 16th. Is also National Pawpaw Day. Our media team at KSU got the third Thursday of September was declared officially National Pawpaw Day because that's the day that we always have our Pawpaw Third Thursday thing. So you can go ahead and mark that on your calendar. Hopefully we will be in person, which would be at the KSU Research Farm in Frankfurt. But if not, then we will be virtual on Facebook. And I would be glad to answer any questions. I answered a few in chat as we went along, but if there's any other questions at the end. I see somebody ask if um, you can get a copy of the presentation. Um, yeah, I would be glad you can, I'll put my um, email address in chat. You can email me or you can put your email address in chat, but yeah, I'd be glad to send you a copy of it. And if anybody has any other questions, then I would be glad to answer them. That was such an awesome presentation. Thank you so much, Sherry. Tons of great information. Um, and thanks for going through the questions and answering all those. Um, yeah, I thought about waiting until the end, but then I thought, well, they may not be able to stay the whole time yeah. and off topic and um, things like that. So no, okay. that is great. Yeah, um, very good. And if you want, if it's easier for you, Sherry, if you want to just email us your a copy of a PDF copy of your um, presentation, then we can just email that out to all the participants today. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, I can do that. Okay. So then we will plan on sending everybody um, that joined us today that presentation. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any further questions? Not looking like it, but thanks so much again to everyone for attending today. And thank you, Sherry, so much for taking time out of your day to do this. Thank you all for coming.
Yeah, and thanks for putting that information about the, I see you put some information about the manure intact. So. Yeah, and that's mostly, I think I was correct it. about the, the trees not being, it's more for vegetables and fruit, because I know we've had problems in the past with people that were using uh, manure on their vegetable garden, uh, where a pasture had been sprayed with forefront, which is one of the, the, the herbicides that's um, that carries over and can kill the plants. But I don't know that it would be for, for trees like, you know, pawpaws. So you might yeah. be correct in that. I just want, thought I'd pass that along because it has some good information. Yeah, it's good to be cautious. So yeah, and I don't know if Ray and Jessica have any more on that point, but no. Yeah. No, nothing on that point. Um, I'll just say thanks for Sherry for speaking today and for everyone uh, for coming out and joining us. And we'll have another Faye if you want to talk about next week's um, class. Um, yeah, so I'll be teaching next week on organic gardening. Um, so it'll be geared to um, just or organic gardening um, in the home garden. So not, you know, different from obviously certified organic, um, but just some um, methods that you can use that are more um, organic uh, toward organic um, uh, growing organically, sorry. Um, and so that's what we'll be covering next week. And then um, that will be our classes for April. And then if you want to look for May and June, we have lots of other classes coming up uh, for those months. And Sherry, I see, did you see where uh, someone asked, is there a mail date for the free KSU scions? Yeah, I answered them by, um, I answered them in chat by direct oh, message. But yeah, we had a thing where we were sending people cyan wood for grafting, which um, we had enough requests. We had too many requests for this year. So if anybody's interested next year, you can email me and we will send people cyan wood, a few pieces of cyan wood to graft. Um, but yeah, he was asking when they would be sent out, which will be in the next couple of weeks. But, but yeah, if you want to do your own grafting, um, next year, we can send you a few sticks of sign wood to do it at home. And hopefully in the past, we had done grafting workshops in the beginning of May. And hopefully next year, I had, you know, we keep moving things out. I'd hope that this year we would be able to do it, but we're still not having big in-person gatherings. Um, but hopefully next year in early May, we will be able to have grafting workshops when you can come and do hands-on grafting in person and have a couple of trees to take home with you. Um, and any of that will be posted on our Facebook page on our website if we have any kind of events like that coming up. Awesome. I know those events have been really popular and, and just excellent in the past because you all have provided even some of the tools for um, doing yeah. crafts. To, so. so yeah, that's a good thing. Hopefully next year we'll be able to be back at that. But again, we'll still have third Thursday thing even if it's on online again, but hopefully by September we'll be able to have, especially if it's outside, you know, have some in-person events. Great. So. All right. Well, all thank right. you so much yeah. again. Yeah. Thank you all for having me.